Hello everybody, um, my name is Peter Llewellyn. For those of you who don't know me, I run the uh, service and resources at medcomsnetworking.com, um, which is an attempt to get people around the world talking about all matters uh, connected with medcoms. Um, and I do that through a variety of means, e events of one sort or another, and at the moment I'm running a series of webinars uh, like the one we're running today. Um, try getting experts, like today we have Jan coming in talking about plain language summaries, talking to you about the topic and inviting your questions. Um, we'll capture, hopefully we'll capture this as a video, which will then be up on Network Pharma TV shortly. Um, so, um, without any more ado, I'm going to hand over to Jan and say, um, Jan, please introduce yourself and give us your presentation and then we'll go to a Q&A. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, hello everyone. My name is Jan Seal Roberts. I am going to do my best to uh, work this technology. Let's hope this works. And hopefully in a moment you will be seeing my screen. Peter, is that working okay? So Peter, you are muted. Yeah, that was okay, Jan. Go on, keep going. Right. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, and Peter, may I say, as I'm always saying, thank you so much for all that you do. I have learnt and felt connected with so much of you through all um, that you do within Medcoms Networking. So it's an absolute privilege for me to have an opportunity to speak today. Play language summaries, what are they? And why do we need them in the peer-reviewed literature? Well, um, Peter's asked me to do this because uh, last month at um, uh, ISMA US, I led with Sarah Griffiths a three and a half hour workshop on plain language summaries and also clinical trial reports. And I thought at the outset, crikey, who needs three and a half hours talking about plain language summaries? And uh, we got along about 30 um, people from pharma. A lot of them were experts, global people. And I was astounded how little people knew and how much interest there was. So when Peter asked me to do this, I was absolutely delighted because um, I'm a little bit of an evangelical when it comes to plain language summaries. Yeah, and I'm just going to butt in briefly, hopefully not interrupt your flow there, but there's a lot of you, I think you're shuffling papers and you might oh, okay. move around a bit, so just try right. and look carefully to... I shall sit rigidly, which is quite hard for me. Sorry, so, we're losing um, what you're saying. Not at all. So um, we know that health, uh, healthcare professionals are struggling to keep up with peer reviewed literature, um, but I think most publishers and authors as well are really trying to do all that they can to um, maximise the impact of, of the articles that they're publishing. So let's talk a little bit about plain language summaries and hopefully I will be able to convince you why you should be seeing them as a, a tool to help you tick both boxes. So first of all, who am I? So uh, my name's Jan, I'm the publishing director with ADIS. In case you don't know ADIS, uh, we are part of Springer Nature. We've been going as a separate entity uh, for about 60 years now. ADIS started off as a, a small company, um, keen to get independent drug information into the hands of uh, decision makers and today we publish about 33 journals all of which focus on drugs and disease therapy so by virtue of that we work with pharma a lot and also agency publication planners to publish data Why am I talking about PLS? Well, ADIS has been publishing and accepting plain language summaries um, for two years now. It seems longer than that, actually. And certainly over that time, we have seen a lot more interest in the facility to publish PLS. We, are the first, we were the first publisher to offer PLS, and now lots of uh, publishers are also doing, doing that. Not everyone, though, and certainly not every journal. But we do find not only are they um, getting more popular in terms of the number of articles that have PLS uh, as part of the submission but they are popular with our readers and not only that but we do see an increase in article level metrics when PLS are included sometimes it's a huge increase and independent research is showing that PLS are increasingly being regarded as being useful um, not only to boost the impact of findings but to absolutely promote and facilitate information assimilation and isn't that part of what it's all about 
So first of all, what is a plain language summary, a PLS? And I want to be very clear here. A PLS is a summary that's published in the peer-reviewed literature alongside a paper. And the aim of the PLS is to summarise in clear language what was published in the article. Nothing more, nothing less. And the aim of the PLS is to provide what we describe as an expert jargon-free summary of the article for any reader who's requiring clarification of what's being presented. So I would say think of the PLS as like a secondary abstract. Um, it's fine to include a bit of jargon. For example, I was in a, a, a workshop a while ago saying, well, should PLS have words like hypertension? I would say if you're publishing in the European Journal of Hypertension, you can assume that readers will know what hypertension means. So, but when it gets to expert jargon, the aim is not to have that in a plain language summary, to keep it as plain and as clear as possible. And the objective of a PLS is to save the reader time and to facilitate a quick understanding of what the article is all about. So in a nutshell, a PLS says what the paper said. They're still not commonplace, but they are, as I said earlier, becoming increasingly popular and, and certainly within clinical and biomedical journals. But please, please, please don't let PLS and what I'm talking about today be confused with either clinical trial um, summaries and these are summaries of an individual trial that has taken place and these are the summaries that are now being mandated in UDRACT. The role of a clinical trial summary is to provide a summary um, for patients who are involved in the clinical trial, what it was all about, what we found out, thank you for being involved. That's a clinical trial summary, that is not a plain language summary. And also PLS should not be confused with specific tools that are now appearing um, in the literature and elsewhere that's purposefully designed for a patient audience and those are being called a number of things but certainly PLS in the peer-reviewed literature are for any reader who is desirous of a summary of the article. So PLS have had several names in the past and uh, I'm not going to repeat them to, in case we've confused people um, but that's really been the root of the confusion. But why include a plain language summary in your article? Well, first of all, for um, a, a time poor clinician, we know often they only have about seven minutes to look at an article. Give me the facts. Once they've found, once they done a Google search, uh, they've got a list of articles, they're going to click on the first one and see what they can find. And if there's a lot of gobbledygook, if it's uh, tense, uh, uh, tense text, they might not know reading it. So PLS are very useful for um, providing a quick entree to an article. Now, that can be useful for uh, non-specialist clinicians perhaps working within the multidisciplinary team, they can be useful for GPs or any clinician who is reading in a perhaps a non-native language. And we find that the clear language in a PLS helps achieve quick assimilation of the key points and thereby at a stroke provides increased readability of the article. But also, it's not just for non-specialists and non-native English speakers, but evidence shows that PLS are increasingly being utilised by time-poor specialists, especially those who don't want to read the whole paper necessarily. It gives them another tool to try and gauge whether they want to read the whole paper or what it's all about. So the first point, it gives you the gist quickly, and if it's of interest or, or suddenly everything's clear, then you can read the whole paper, really from your leg up to the article also can be used instead of reading the whole article. But also we're finding that PLS are being um, accessed by um, the press wanting to understand an article and also well-informed patients and their carers or anybody, healthcare um, professionals but also uh, taxpayers, um, people who are creating formularies, anyone who wants a quick summary of, of an article that's appeared in the peer-reviewed literature. So as a result of including a PLS, the paper has increased uh, clarity. We like to feel transparency as well as readability and hopefully impact and thereby likely to achieve greater reach. So I would say PLS, if you can, why wouldn't you? So who's responsible for creating plain language summaries and when at which point are these submitted? Well I hope it goes without saying that 
uh, PLS are the responsibility of the authors who are submitting the paper. But it is true to say at the moment, um, some authors are struggling because it does take a different skill not to be uh, writing in, in the passive voice, but the active voice, and to actually know the sort of level to be writing at. So at the moment, quite a few agencies are providing specialist uh, writing support to write PLS, but authors are getting quite good at it. it, it, it it's not just a special skill set, but it's a mindset as well. But the, the PLS are the responsibility of the authors. And when are these submitted? Well, most, are, most publishers are currently requiring PLS to be submitted at the time of the paper being submitted. A few reasons for that. Uh, it's mostly to facilitate peer review. I'll talk about that in a moment. But a few publishers are allowing PLS to follow afterwards, and certainly our ADIS Rapid Journals um, uh, allow these to follow. Um, we recognise that that can be useful because um, people will sometimes say to us, look, if we don't know a paper's going to be um, accepted by a, a journal that accepts PLS, why should we bother creating the resource? Um, I would say that PLS should be created alongside the paper right at the very beginning. It shouldn't be something you think of at the end, but something that you're intrinsically thinking about at the beginning beginning. But most publishers therefore ex ex require them at the start, at the time of um, acceptance, but do ask. But one important point is that PLS should always be peer-reviewed and um, that's something you should expect. Now I hope I don't have to explain why but just in case you're wondering why they have to be peer-reviewed for accuracy and to ensure that they only represent uh, what was presented in the paper and make no other claims and it's also about balance as well that certain aspects aren't being brought out at the expense of others. So always peer-reviewed, the responsibility of the authors uh, submitting the paper and where are they positioned well, with most, um, article, with most articles, and certainly with all of the ages articles, plain language summaries sit just below the main abstract. But they can additionally be hosted elsewhere, and certainly for our ages journals, if there is a plain language summary, it will appear just below the main abstract, but there will also be a link from the article itself to Figshare, and um, so therefore the plain language summaries are discoverable on Figshare as well. For all of our journals that are PubMed indexed, we try and ensure that the plain language summary also appears alongside the abstract on PubMed. I should say at the moment that PubMed's policy of including these is variable, um, but hopefully we're getting through um, uh, the hoops that are necessary. We found that some of our journals uh, were having PLS um, hosted alongside um, the abstract on PubMed, others weren't. And some publishers have said they totally failed and others seem to have more success. So work in progress, I think, is PubMed are beginning to see the value of PLS and accept these more readily. But one important point is where you are publishing an article in a hybrid journal, and hopefully people will know that hybrid journals are those that are naturally behind a paywall but with open access options, you should always ensure that the PLS is in front of the paywall, so available open access as would be the abstract, to make sure that this can be easily read before the article itself is, is uh, downloaded or people pay to download the article. But it is early days and PLS quality um, in published literature is currently, I think, what I would politely term inconsistent. So just as here where they appear, this is an article um, published in one of our Asia's journals, Drugs Real World Outcome, and you can see there's the article, um, open access, abstract, and just below the abstract there's a new title that says plain language summary, and that then uh, appears below there. So easily discoverable. Um, you just have to look. So what makes a good plain language summary? Well, I would say two things, content of course, but also format, and format can be really, really important. In terms of content, you need to focus on the significance of the research, the so what, rather than the details of the how. So really about the, you know, what, what the key points were, the key outcomes. Methodology tends to be less important, so maybe results and, and, and the so what. But sometimes methodology is important, but whenever you are considering a PLS, you need to consider what language is appropriate for the intended audience. That can depend on the therapeutic area, but it may also depend on the nature of the article. For example, if it's a health outcomes paper or something that's very statistically uh, intense. But generally speaking, as I said earlier, common non-expert jargon and um, abbreviations that are widely recognised are 
acceptable. But be very careful if you've got complex statistics because that will totally negate the, the readability of the article. So, for example, for clarity, um, I think it's now being well recognised that in terms of numbering, it's often helpful to consider generalising the numbers. So instead of saying 0.55, you might say one half or, or approximately a third. You have to be very careful there, though, um, to, to ensure that you're not changing the overall mean. So where there's great significance in, 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 in the amount, perhaps it's more appropriate to refer to this as just a significance rather than the numbers. So care is needs not to change the, the meaning, but where you can generalise using words rather than numbers, that really does help. But as I said earlier, format can be very, very important. So when you can, I would always recommend, and this is not just true of plain language summaries, to consider the use of bullet points, side headings, anything to break up the text, because it's often solid um, chunks of text that reduce the readability before you get onto the words. And don't forget um, that infographics can be very useful. And when um, research is done looking at readability, it's often infographics that are um, regarded as being the most useful to improve the readability. And, and the clarity of information. So using um, infographics um, is certainly to be encouraged if, if they are um, accepted. But just to emphasise that the um, skills and experience of a trained medical writer is use, usually very useful uh, to optimise the, um, the, the success and the readability of a, um, a, a good plain language summary. A little bit about readability. Um, first of all, a plain language summary should never just be a dumbed down version of an abstract. A huge mistake to think that, and I've seen many examples where that was assumed. It should be written absolutely de novo in a clear way. Uh, you can assume some prior knowledge because people are going to be looking in the, the peer reviewed literature. They will be looking for things deliberately not happening upon them. So this is different from information that's designed for patients. But um, expert jargon should be avoided. So instead, I like to encourage people to think of an executive summary. Now, what I mean there is I once had a boss who had a very short attention span, a very bright guy, and I remember once putting together a very well-reasoned, long um, paper about a particular point I was trying to make, and I had all the qualifiers, I had all the details, and presented it to him feeling very pleased. And he said, Jan Jan, just give me the basics, just give me the facts. So with a great deal of work, I got it down to a page and took it back to him feeling quite smug. And he said, Jan, you're not getting it. What I need is a quick executive summary. And then I got it. He wanted just a paragraph giving him the overall clear meaning. And that's what I like to think about a plain language summary. It's not something you're presenting for an eight year old, it's something you're presenting to somebody with respect, giving all the clarity, the points you want to get across in that brief summary. So um, think of an executive summary, but readability can be important to consider. And there are lots of tools available if you're wanting to look into the readability. So for example, Microsoft Word in itself has a readability tool. You just have to click on the right bar um, to find it. But there are some online readability tools as well. Readability Pro and readability formulas um, are, are, are examples I've given here. There is research um, that was presented at uh, ISMAP Europe earlier this year um, recommending for plain language summaries um, a, a readability extra 14 to 18 years and if we're looking for high school educated it's about years 9 to 12 so we're not talking about idiots we're talking about people um, for whom it can be uh, assumed they have a degree of education but it's really all about clarity so I would say use readability only as a guide and at the moment the best way to check out the usefulness of plain language summaries is to get um, uh, non-expert peers to read them through or lay readers is it clear what we're trying to say but just to emphasise, infographics can make all the difference. I couldn't resist putting this infographic about the role of infographics for summarising medical literature. So where can plain language summaries be published? Well, it's changing as we speak, and it is quite patchy still at the moment, but they are becoming a lot more commonplace. Uh, it does depend on the publisher, but not just the publisher, the individual journal as well, and often in the um, therapeutic area concerned. So certainly rheumatology, dermatology, neurology, uh, there are a lot of PLS there, fewer in oncology.
Um, but as I said earlier, um, ACE journals have been accepting them for the last two years. And um, uh, uh, there are a few journals that are now mandating them. For example, PLOS Medicine. Uh, they describe PLS as author summaries. And actually, they're quite brief. They're only two or three sentences. And they say, please um, supply information emphasizing really why the study was done, what the researchers did and found, and what do they mean. Here we are again, the so what. And they go on to say bullet points should be objective, brief, succinct and specific, accurate, and avoid technical language. So, but PLOS Medicine don't request these um, until uh, revised proof stage, and that's so that um, authors will know that their paper has been accepted. But many, many publishers are now accepting these. We do say just ask. But if they don't accept PLS, use an infographic as well. And um, don't forget that an infographic can be inserted as figure one. There are ways around these things. So just a couple of examples. Um, here is a, an original uh, abstract that was published a couple of months ago in one of our journals, uh, Diabetes Therapy, and it's all about semaglutide. And here it all is, uh, what they did, uh, uh, objectives were projected, what the results were. It's all words to me. Um, low reporting threshold, but here's the plain language summary. The author has decided to break it down into bullet points, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, leading sentences, and we then talk about the uh, sustained clinical trial program, uh, uh, what it was about, once weekly, some glue tired associated with improved efficacy versus uh, other drugs, the present analysis used clinical treatment approach, and here's the, the um, some glue tied improved life expectancy, and both doses offer highly cost-effective alternatives. It's broken down into bite-sized chunks, but the language is very clear. If you want to look at that, have a look at the, the link below. Here's another one. This is a big chunk of text, hydrocodone, uh, chlorpheniramine, um, all about what it is. And the accompanying plain language summary, again, this is the way the, way the author summarised. It's in a very basic language. People often use medicines concerning opioids to treat cough symptoms. Uh, why was this review carried out? Uh, two pieces of evidence found. Um, cough medicines, they can cause harmful side effects. The evidence was used to draw the following conclusions. The risks in, ch in children are greater than any benefits. Older medicines should be reviewed regularly. So this is more of a simplistic one, but I think, again, it, it's very useful. So why should you be suggesting inclusion of a PLS for your next paper? Well, as I started off by saying, healthcare professionals are struggling to keep up with the published literature. We all know this, and they are looking for shortcuts. In many of our um, articles that we publish, especially for our ages drug evaluation programmes, we have shout box, a uh, quick few points um, to summarise the article. But this is really taking it to the next level uh, and providing a quick resume of what is in the article. So it's really a bright and useful shortcut for healthcare professionals to decide what to read. Do I need to bother reading? the whole article but to understand what they're trying to read often too quickly so that's what I meant by saying it's a quick entree into an article give them the, 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 the basic summary and then if they want to then go back and read the um, the whole article it's given them a, a step up if you like but it is the case that healthcare professionals are proactively seeking bite-sized summaries but also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, healthcare professionals are often working as a multidisciplinary team and they may not be experts in the paper that they're trying to understand. But also, don't forget non-native uh, English speakers trying to access the peer-reviewed literature. But also, um, that lots of other readers are seeking information in the peer-reviewed literature. As I mentioned earlier, it may be payers, formal decision makers, educated patients and carers, taxpayers, and um, even the press. So a PLS essentially helps an ill author to take control of the message that is being received by the non-expert reader. And that's another reason why they have to be really well um, peer reviewed to make sure that they're saying no more, no less, that it's summarising in a very clear and balanced way what is being presented in the article itself. So, in short, a PLS gives the paper increased clarity as well as transparency. You're making it very clear uh, what you're saying within the paper, as well as improving the readability and the impact. And our data indicates that by including PLS, it is likely to give a paper greater reach. But please remember, a PLS is not a dumbed-down version of the abstract. It's instead an executive summary, think of my demanding boss, for any reader of the peer-reviewed literature requiring a shortcut. 
and ideally it should be prepared at the same time as the paper not considered at the very last minute or oh, we're publishing with the journal um, that accepts VLS or oh, can somebody quickly put something together no it's much better it's considered part of the paper um, at the time that it's being uh, created but please, I would suggest at this stage not to be too hung up on readability, but do get the advice of non-expert readers um, when you're developing. And I think most people will recognise um, good PLS when they see them. Quite frankly, when I'm looking at a complicated paper, if there is a PLS, I will read that first. And I really find it's very useful uh, to then find my way into the article itself. Many journals are accepting PLS, just ask. But if a journal doesn't accept the PLS, do consider increasing an infographic as another tool to make um, your, the information that you're portraying as clear as possible for healthcare professionals. But just to emphasise once again, healthcare professionals really are looking for shortcuts and PLS will help. So my argument is, why wouldn't you include one if you possibly can? So that's everything I had to say, Peter. I think at this point I stop sharing. And okay, so I thanks, to yeah. you. Perfect. Absolutely excellent. Thank you, Jan. Um, that was very good, very comprehensive, and I did follow all of that. Um, can I just say to the audience, um, again, for those of you joining a little bit late, we've got two options for you. There's a Q&A button and the chat button at the bottom. Of the um, please, if you can use those. Jan, again, sorry, your paper's all... <laughs> yep, sorry, just moved my keyboard. Getting closer. Um, I'll stop. <laughs> so yeah, so if, if the audience can uh, use their Q&A button or their chat button, um, as some of you already have started to do, to send in any questions or observations, comments or critiques, then that would be great. Um, and we'll have a little bit of a Q&A for 10 minutes or so. Um, just out of interest, Jan, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to labour this point slightly, although you did make it very clear, but speaking as an, an observer on this, um, there's a lot of talk of PLS at the moment. Um, and, um, and I feel like we've been talking about this, some of the meetings we ran the publication plan uh, uh, updates we used to talk about this sort of thing and um, this become this become very um very lively topic recently but it's very concerned with the patient and i just want to um ask i suppose you've made it very clear you see the pls as being for non-expert audience which includes the informed patient as yeah. a journal or as a publisher do you go do you draw a line and do you go beyond that and do you as, as a journal are there options to include items additional items for patients that are absolutely 100% for the patient or do you see the PLS um, as going as far as you want to go in that direction? Um, there are two questions there. First of all, in terms of the peer-reviewed literature, to, to begin with, there was this sense that PLS were there for patients and only for patients, and they should be dumbed down to the level, and I mean no, no disrespect to patients, but it would be inappropriate to include a PLS that wasn't appropriate for a patient, an uneducated patient to read. Uh, really getting confused with the cl clinical trial summaries that must be appropriate for patients who can be for, for whom no prior background or knowledge should be assumed apart from having taken place in the trial for plain language summaries these are part of the peer-reviewed literature and are therefore aimed at anybody who's accessing the peer-reviewed literature which is in our experience primarily healthcare professionals and what we don't want to do is to lose the opportunity to provide a very Healthcare professionals by having them too dumbed down. But from our point of view, as far as PLS are concerned, they are there for anybody who would like to use them. And certainly I would not um, I would not disregard the possibility of patients using them. We do know that, for example, in multiple sclerosis, I've often had GPs saying to me, my patients know much more than, than I do, and it's true of rare diseases as well. So we are agnostic, but what we are saying is this is not an opportunity to create something at a very low level for patients. That is a wasted opportunity, but we absolutely endorse all the other material that's being provided for patients through patient groups, but also within the second question, within um, AIDIS, we do quite a lot of material, particularly within our AIDIS rapid journals, um, um, that is aimed at giving the patient perspective. For example, um, we have um, patient physician pieces where a patient will uh, write a part of an article giving their experience of a, 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 a disease and the uh, healthcare professional will then write in response to that and how that knowledge has helped them to improve the treatment and the health outcomes of the patient. So absolutely we're not negating the need for patients for information. I'm just saying the PLS should not be aimed specifically at the, 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 the very specific requirements for non-educated patients. Okay, cool. No, that, that, that makes sense. And are we just, there's a question in here about impact on printed journals. Are we yeah. just talking about the online journal version? Um, at the, 
certainly all of our journals are published um, uh, online but for the print ones we include them in, in print as well and at the moment it's it, 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 at the moment we're saying if you want to include them in, include them we're not mandating them and um, certainly there is no extra cost to, to include them as far as we're concerned it's okay. all about improving readability. So, so directly answering that question it doesn't it's just added into the printed journal as, as it yeah. So can I ask a question which I guess I know the obvious answer to, or maybe I don't, but uh, we'll see. Um, why aren't you mandating it? Um, because at the moment it's hard enough to get uh, people to, to write them. To begin with, people said, oh, you'll be lucky. Um, this is direct consumer by another means. And that's why we are very clear to say this is not, these are tools for healthcare professionals. Um, it is, it, it is, it's an extra cost, it's an extra thing to think about. And that's, I think, partly why um, for, for uh, our Ages Rapid journals, they are allowing people to send them subsequently because ultimately lots of people are wanting to send them, but uh, maybe we don't if it's an agency don't have the green light to to produce them before they've got definite acceptance or haven't had the resources i think as people are gathering experience in developing these um, they are realizing it's not rocket science it, it's just a way of thinking it's a, it's a disciplined way of thinking um, i think in a way for many people it's a slightly trickier way of thinking but once you get into the mindset it's it's something that we should all naturally be aware of how to do because we've all been if you're a writer like i was in a former life you were schooled in using the the passive tense and all the qualifiers that actually make text a lot more complicated this is going the other way it's actually distilling it down to the key points the executive summary okay and again um i think it's a reflection of maybe the confusion between whether this is for a patient or not but um, yeah. i've seen commentary about how bearing in mind the audience we're talking with um you know these, these papers may be funded supported in some way by farm and so on you know is it because they because someone's thinking patients therefore this might be direct to consumer type advertising is, is that why the is, is that an issue and is that is that issue avoided if we don't talk about patients we just talk about the, the broader audience does that make sense um, I'm, I'm not trying to be devious uh, you know in, in terms of all oh, let's pretend they're not for patients i am saying um that ultimately if, if patients are looking for information um they go by mr google if it, it, you know, patient advocacy groups are doing a heck of a lot of stuff and, and i think if they're looking for education at, at a lower level that should be where they are encouraged to go but we do know that lots of patients are looking for information and if they're seeking the peer-reviewed literature and they're happy to access that then isn't it great that you know this information is there as a tool for them as, as well as to others but that is not our primary directive um it is for uh, th those seeking clarification in in, in the peer reviewed literature okay let's okay uh, let's pick up some of these questions that are coming in can we um just dodging around a little bit um a couple of questions in terms of ideal length um does ages have general guidelines for developing pls like word count limit so how specific are you when when you write your advice there um, we're terribly nice in ADIS and uh, we have been as broad as possible. Our first mission has really been to encourage them. So we like to say that we are agnostic. That's partly because to begin with, we were feeling our way. And secondly, because uh, different articles really lend themselves to different lengths. So we would say, generally speaking, aim for something similar to the um, abstract, certainly no longer. But, but generally speaking, we are as, as loose in our guidance as possible uh, because we are feeling our way and different therapeutic areas and types of articles seem to lend themselves to a slightly different uh, way of laying things out. Okay, um, so and a, a question here from Emma, are there separate reviewers that review the PLS to ensure they're not too technical? Do, do, you, do you look at it in that way or are they just no. part of the same peer review system? Um, no, we are looking at them ourselves in-house in and at the moment we are using peer reviewers to make sure that we're not changing the sense and to me that's the biggest danger. Um, it, it, for us with an agency, you know, we can recognise something clear. Certainly, I can. Uh, bear a little brain and all that. Um, so uh, 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 we know when it's right. What we don't tend to do is say uh, this is rubbish. Do it again because we are trying to um, effectively remove barriers. But I think going forward, because some people are still aiming them far too low, um, we will go back and say, Eek, yeah, I think you're missing a trick here. Not not yeah, you know, homework get it right next time but really just think a little bit more um, about you know, the, the sort of level of, of, of reading that you're trying to and I think in, to begin with across all um, all publishers I think PLS it were aimed a little bit too low to begin with as dumbed down abstracts and frankly some of them are 
so off-putting that actually it, it, it ruins the readability. You, you feel quite insulted and then it, it breaks the flow. Um, but making it clear, getting non-experts to, to review it, those sorts of tools will help. And as I said, readability can help. And a lot is talked about readability, but I think really that is more useful for the clinical trial summaries where you're really trying to get it down to a lower level. And that tends to be recommended at the moment about reading age about 11 or, to 11 or 12, maybe even lower. Um, but obviously then you can get diminishing returns if you're not careful. Okay, um, and again a practical question, um, can you include visuals in the PLS? So uh, you, you've suggested if you can't put a text PLS in you use a, a, an infographic, I understood that point, yeah. but practically speaking say within the ADIS journals can you put an infographic in as a PLS or can you include yeah. the individual in the PLS? A absolutely, we love infographics and more importantly research shows that readers do as well. Um, especially, I mean, actually, we have a, a story we often tell about a, um, an article that was submitted for peer review, and the methodology was very important, it was very complicated, and um, it, it kept being rejected, and um, the authors came back a third time saying, I'm sorry, forgive us, but please, can we just explain, the methodology is, is perhaps a little bit you know, unclear, they put in the methodology, the peer reviewer said, wow, now we get it, so uh, really just an example of how infographics can be very, very useful, so we would always welcome uh, infographics. And they are, as I think I mentioned, you know, the, the top thing for bringing clarity. And several journals um, do have um, a, a, often infographic as, 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 as part of their abstract that don't necessarily say they set to PLS. And um, there's a question, I might as well ask it, but I might be missing the technical uh, point here. Would an infographic in the PLS be seen as a visual abstract? Is there a technical point there? I, I might be Ooh. missing that. Um, uh, um, so we have video abstracts and that's something different. So yeah, I suppose it would be a visual abstract, but not to be confused with a video abstract. And that's where you, know, you have a video and it's, it's animated. So this is something static that is visually appealing within a PLS. Okay, but Does that help? To follow that point, I'm not quite sure actually, Tina, if you, I'm not quite sure if I'm missing the, the point there. So if you want to clarify that question, feel free to, to, um, to help me on that one. Um, David's asking, do you have a sense of how comfortable the legal teams from pharma are about these kinds of summaries so the concepts are moving away from agreed company lexicon? Um, certainly uh, let me say that um, the PLS workshop that I did at ISMAP was um, very well attended with very important global people um, who are clearly seeing this as an opportunity and once I started saying this is not trying to get to patients by another means, this is healthcare professionals, they would say this, this is exactly it. And I think everybody now suddenly feels that that, that, that they get it, that people re realise you know, the difficulties that healthcare professionals are having and I think pharma is, is, is as aware as, as, as anybody. So as long as it's not looking as though we've, it, or any publishers have got devious means, I, I think yeah, everyone will be happy as long as they are uh, peer reviewed. Okay. And from the publisher's point of view, we, we certainly insist that they are. Okay. And um, can I, I put you on the spot slightly? You've, you've talked about um, PLS being patchy out there. Um, yeah. And presumably that applies to the overall marketplace, but within ABIS, it's, it's yeah. within those journals, it's still patchy. But I mean, yeah. frankly and honestly, and can you give us a sense of, you know, is it, is it picking up? Are, are people submitting? Oh, more? yeah. Is there some Absolutely. sense of where this is going? Um, well, uh, we've certainly seen, we've been doing it for the last two years, and I would say now it's probably about 10%. Um, okay, of, of submissions if, if that helps uh, but it's where the metrics come in um, that it really gets exciting because we can certainly see an increase in full text downloads where a PLS is is, um, is included what we don't know is, is well what I don't know is, is who is utilizing these and what we don't know at the moment is how this improves clinical outcomes which is ultimately obviously what it's all about but as publishers we are trying to do all that we can to facilitate uh, reading uh, the, the reach of our articles but, but also the the downloads as well because there are so many things that stand in the way of healthcare professionals accessing information and we don't want the information to be you know, difficult to, to access through lack of readability okay okay cool what i'm what i'm going to do if i may is call is, is draw a line for the sort of the, the, the formal part of this session and uh for the recording and um and, and say a big thanks to Jan. Uh, for those of you online at the moment, do, um, do stick around because we'll, we can carry on talking. There's still a couple of questions there and feel free to send more small questions in. But well, I, I know we've had a few problems with the, the um, sound, but I think we'll get away with it. So I think for now, we'll draw a line on this recording and hopefully see that later on Network Farm TV. Um, what I'll say is um, we're, we're running a number of these webinars every Wednesday at the moment at 12 o'clock UK time. Please come and 
have a look at medcomsnetworking.com to see what else is going on. Um, I know Jan is very happy to hear from you uh, via LinkedIn and so on. So please do reach out and ask any questions. Um, so can I, uh, as I say, for the form part of the session, just start by saying, or just finish by saying, big thank you to Jan, um, appreciate it. Um, if we give everybody a wave, I'll turn off the recording. So bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Um, yeah. Thank you, Peter.